Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to another video here this week. This week's video, we're gonna be talking about a specific type of radio control car that we race that breaks essentially all of the rules that we have been talking about on the channel thus far. Essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down exactly which rules those are, why this type of radio control vehicle actually breaks those rules. We're gonna explain what those types of RC cars are. And then lastly, we're gonna end by talking about how we can make certain that our radio control power systems are still going to be the most reliable, even though we push these systems right near and past their limits. So let's go ahead and jump right into the topic for today. Day. These types of radio control cars that break all of our rules is essentially the radio control vehicles that go through a couple passes to achieve straight line speed. Straight line racing, not only does it apply to radio control cars, which is going to be the primary topic for today, but it does include other areas of the hobby, which can be seen in radio controlled boats and certain types of radio controlled airplanes as well. Essentially, all these types of radio control vehicles are trying to achieve maximum top speed in a very short burst of power to get there. The typical way that this would work for radio control cars, aside from drag racing, is you would make one high speed short duration pass in one direction, you'd get the radio control car turned around and you'd complete one last pass in the opposite direction and then you'd bring that car back in and that would essentially be the entire run for that car. Now it may be quite obvious as to why this is very different than the other type of racing that we do, even if we are just bashing. Now typically when we are running our radio control cars, we are running for long durations of time, let's say eight minutes or so, or upwards of even 20 minutes on some models. And during that time, we might be hitting 120 amps under hard acceleration. However, the most of our run, we're just cruising around and hitting probably let's say 60 to 80 amps. The big thing is our power system is essentially selected so that a 120 amp peak is really within a good close continuous current approximation. So imagine having a 120 amp rated motor, a 120 amp rated speed control that can operate continuously within these power draws. However, we are only going to hit a maximum draw from those components of 120 amps under hard acceleration. This essentially means that the majority of the run, we're gonna be nowhere near 120 amps. We're gonna be closer to like 60 to 80 amps, which makes our power system extremely reliable. That is the big key difference. And occasionally we might be over that 120 amp mark and pulling maybe 140 or 150, but we're staying within a very narrow range range, not exceeding maximums very often. Now, even when we select our battery for this power system, our battery is gonna be selected so that it is able and very capable of delivering that 120 amps for the continuous duration of our run. Even when we talk about our LiPo battery that we select for this specific radio control vehicle to operate for 10 to 15 minutes or so, we are still selecting that battery so that it can make certain it delivers 120 amps for the continuous amount of time that we're running it. Now when it comes to our straight line racing, this is entirely different. We can take that exact same power system that we were using in our previous example and use it right in our straight line radio control vehicle. This means that our 120 amp rated motor, speed control, and battery can be put in our straightaway vehicle. However, we're not going to be drawing only 120 amps from this particular setup. What's gonna happen is we're gonna go and pull much more current and demand much more power out of all of these different components. Now it's important to realize when we do this, we are always subjecting ourselves with tons of risk. And it's good to note that if you are going to participate in this type of radio controlled racing, that you may find yourself with some less than pleasurable results. The biggest thing that we talk about on this channel is how do we maintain reliability and make sure that this is going to be okay or we're at least doing the best that we can to maintain reliability for our power system. So let's talk about how first this is even possible. 
We can draw 200 amps from a 120 amp rated speed control because we're operating our radio control cars for a very, very short duration of time. We're simply making one high speed pass in one direction and returning in the opposite direction. And then we bring our car in and that's essentially it for that run. So less than 30 seconds of total operation time and your car is going to be coming back in and cooling off for the next run that you can make. What we're doing by only making a couple passes is reducing our risk for failure. It's important to note that time increases heat. More time equals more heat. And heat is what destroys our brushless motors, our lithium polymer batteries, or our electronic speed controls. So that's a big part of what we're doing here, keeping that time down to a minimum. The next question is how do we increase and maximize the reliability of our power systems when we're participating in this type of racing? Well, there's a couple things that we can do and one is essentially mandatory and that comes down to the temperature gun. You wanna make sure that you're measuring the temperature of your motor after you make a single pass before you move on to making two passes. You wanna make certain that you're measuring the temperature in multiple areas on the motor to find the area where it is at a maximum. You want to make certain that you are not achieving the maximum temperature threshold for that motor and then repeat the exact same process for your battery pack. And lastly, you wanna repeat the exact same process for your speed control. More than likely, your motor and speed control are at the most risk for damage. You want to make certain that you're measuring the temperature on the speed control in multiple different areas, very similar to what we spoke about for the motor. However, there are two specific sections on the speed control that you want to get maximums from. One is going to be the temperature of the heat sink as close to the base of the heat sink as possible. This is about as close to the FETs, the transistors, that you can essentially get to. The second area that you wanna make certain that you're getting a temperature reading from is the capacitors on the input, the battery input side of the speed control. Those are the two primary areas that you want to make certain that you're measuring temperatures. And you want to compare these temperatures up to, again, the maximum specification for your speed control that should come right from the manufacturer. The next question is, what happens if you realize that you are exceeding the maximum threshold for temperature on your lithium polymer battery pack or your brushless motor? Well, there are a couple things that you would be able to do. One of them is you can simply just reduce the amount of power that you're pulling from those components. The easiest way to get this done is by reducing the pinion gear count that you have right on your motor. If you are running a 30 tooth pinion gear right on your brushless motor, reducing this a couple teeth at a time will hopefully get you there at the temperature that you are looking for. Another thing that you could do if it was hot on the motor side is add cooling fans, increase airflow, anything of this nature just to get that temperature down. You do not want to operate the car when you are exceeding the maximum thermal temperatures of any of the components. Another area is what happens if you're exceeding the maximum thermal temperatures of the capacitors on your speed control? What do you do? Well, there's a couple things that you can do here as well. One of them is going to a higher C rated battery pack will reduce the load on the capacitors. If you don't already know what ripple voltage is, I would highly recommend looking it up here on the channel. A very quick summarization of where you would experience ripple voltage. Ripple voltage for the typical straight line RC vehicle is going to be found in that time when you're operating at partial throttle. As soon as you go and line it up on the line and you start to get going, you wanna make sure that the tires are going to hook up. So you don't go full throttle right away. You give it a partial throttle, you're gonna be under heavy load because you still are accelerating aggressively, but not aggressively enough to break loose. Once you know that those tires are gonna hook up, then you can full send it, go full throttle, and hit your top speed. During any time where you're at partial throttle, that is where you could experience high ripple voltage. 
Using a battery pack that has a higher C rating or is capable of dumping more power can help offset ripple voltage within your speed control. Another solution that could work for you and is highly recommended is to use a capacitor bank on the input side of your speed control. Now that we have covered the temperature part of this, what else can you do to ensure and maximize reliability? Well, my recommendation, and this is not necessarily necessary, I would recommend to go and get a speed control that gives you the data logging function. This is something that I'm very interested in all of my models, whether I'm straight line racing or if I'm running for continuous periods of time. I wanna know the type of performance that I'm getting out of my specific power systems. I wanna know how much current, how much wattage I'm pulling. I want to also know where is the voltage at when it's under load. Other areas that I look for is the ripple voltage that we've talked about. If you can data log ripple voltage, this will give you some significant insight as to what's happening. And we have videos on the channel that explain what to do and what kind of threshold actually makes sense for ripple voltage. Another area that's important is watching what the temperature does as you go through an entire run. When you get the radio control car back to wherever you're standing and measuring the temperature there, you may not actually be seeing the maximum temperature. You might take a couple minutes just to pull off all the clips, remove the body, and by the time you do that, that motor is already cooling down. When you get the data log right from your system, you can see the temperature, where it hits a max, what that max is and that will help you ensure the most optimal amount of reliability within your power system. So all of these are significant areas that can help quite tremendously. Well guys, that pretty well does it for this video. Keep in mind that anytime we are pushing the components very hard within our power systems, we are always at risk of certain types of failure. However, on this channel, we try to reduce the amount of risk to failure and that's why we talk about the things that we talk about. As always, like the video if you do. Don't forget to hit that sub button so that I can see you in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.